Good morning. Uh, the scripture reading for uh, the, the sermon today is from 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to, for I did this, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, him who was crucified. And with you in him is weakness and in fear and how much you are trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power, so that your faith might so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Thank you, Jackson. Well, good morning again. What a blessing to be here. It's uh, one of those typical spring days here in Washington, isn't it? It'll uh, maybe stop raining by the 4th of July. We'll see. Um, I really appreciate all of you that have been coming to Sunday morning class. There's a lot of a lot of uh, learning to be done in the in the study on First Corinthians that we're doing. If you're not and you're interested, we can get you the website. If you're if you're looking for a Bible study to do at home, uh, something to supplement what you're reading. The Bible Talk TV website is a really good place to be. But we're starting through 1 Corinthians. We're up to, I think we, we're not all the way through chapter 2 yet um, in 1 Corinthians. But there is a lot to be said about wisdom. Paul is talking a lot about wisdom. Um, in, the, in the verse that, uh, or in the verses that Jackson just read, he's talking about God's wisdom. And we're we're going to see that there's some juxtaposition about wisdom and and the the wisdom of God is is so much, or the wisdom of man is is not even close to if there was God's foolishness. Thank you, Michael. So we're going to spend some time talking about wisdom, but I want us to think about as we go through this how we value wisdom and what kind, because wisdom is a is a value. Co- valuable commodity that maybe we think about it maybe we don't we we call out the people we we know that have it if you look in job chapter 28 there's quite a discussion on the value of wisdom compared to uh different things on earth he compares it to gold wisdom is more valuable than gold more valuable than pearl it's more valuable than than a lot of different things and we know what well, we're going to talk about what godly wisdom is. On In the world, wisdom is the quality or state. This is from dictionary.com. It's not me sounding this smart. The quality or, or, or state of being wise. Well, okay. Oops, department of the obvious. It's knowledge of what is true or right, coupled with just judgment as to action. And one of my favorite words, it's sagacity. I just, sagacity. So those are all good things to have, right? We we all want wisdom. We all want to be smart. We all want to have, we all want to be sagacious. Think of all the places people look for wisdom. Because there's a lot of time spent looking for wisdom. Uh, scholars, people, people go to uh, people who have degrees or, or in the education system. Some turn to books, read it themselves, or the, or the internet, podcasts. Uh, I'm not smart enough to even figure out podcasts, but people go there looking for wisdom. And then there's that image, and I've seen it in a lot of cartoons, of the people that climb the mountain. And they go to the guy who's wearing a, some version of a toga, right? And they climb up, and they, they get there, and they, they ask for the wisdom. Now, I just think it's odd that on that take, the guy at the top of the mountain usually says something so simple and so obvious that the person who climbed the mountain in search of the wisdom says, it's that easy? Really? It's just interesting that that's our view of that guy in the toga on top of the hill. Maybe we don't have to go all that way. But when you boil everything down, 
take all those sources, and you analyze them, and you look at them. Really, the only reliable source of wisdom is God, because God knows everything. He doesn't know. He doesn't just know everything. He knows everything across time. Where we know somebody who is wise because they know this much in this time frame, God knows everything. God, God knows all across the span of time. And we know that when it comes to the most important topic we're ever going to deal with here on earth, which the popular opinion would disagree with me, because it's not money, and it's not which house to buy or which career to pursue, it's where are you going to spend eternity? If you are looking at answering that question, then God's wisdom is the only source. And we, we have to start with a reverence for God. It has to start there. But we also know that everything that is labeled as wise is not wisdom. The Bible spends a lot of time talking about the contrast or the juxtaposition between God's wisdom and the wisdom of this world. We see a lot of places where, and, and right here in 1 Corinthians, where he talks about the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. Now, God's not foolish, but you know what I mean. Because where godly benefit or godly wisdom benefits all, worldly wisdom is usually, almost always, focused on self and seeks to benefit just the individual. Sometimes even at the expense of harming others. Doesn't seem like wisdom. Worldly wisdom is filled with pride. If you look at Proverbs 26, verse 12, it captures this really well. It says, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And wise men of this world almost, well, a lot of the time have a hard time accepting the gospel because it doesn't originate with man. They can't go to the source. And it requires putting others before self. It's a hard wisdom for some to choke on or for some to accept. But we have to humbly hear Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. And it says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. I hope you can get your feeling hurt, because right there, he tells us we're not the brightest bulbs on the tree. That's okay, because we know that we're working on wisdom that does not come from here. So I, I always appreciated Paul's honesty there because we're not all that bright comparatively. But when a person thinks he or she is already wise, that's a dangerous spot to be in because they will likely not learn wisdom, true wisdom, without a major change in their life. Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. It's good advice. Somebody may, may remind you that you're not as smart as you think you are. We know where God's wisdom comes from. We have the word of God. But we should candidly understand and remind ourselves of the places where the world assumes wisdom exists or originates. We talked about a couple of these already. Scholarship. A scholar is not necessarily a source of wisdom. Just because somebody has a, a degree and a lot of letters after their name, it does not necessarily mean that they can easily or even automatically translate their knowledge into wisdom. Please don't confuse those two. Having a lot of knowledge is not the same as wisdom. You can be pretty smart and not be wise. So, Scholars, doctors, 
peach teas, whatever flavor you want to put on those, they're not necessarily wise. So let's let's keep that one in context. Monetary success is not necessarily a guarantee of wisdom. You can be rich and be dishonest. You can you can totally cheat and build the system and still and still get rich. Now, that's not to say that there are rich people who can't share their information, right? I, I wouldn't turn down the uh, opportunity to sit down with Warren Buffett or Fred Smith or any of the others on the top 400 richest people in America. If I had the chance to hear their insight, I think it would be pretty awesome. But if I want real knowledge, if I want real wisdom, if we as a body want to pursue real true wisdom, we should go to the word of God. That's where it originates. We got to make sure that we're, when we're talking about wisdom, we're pursuing the right source. You know, another one, uh, age is another assumed source of wisdom. I should say more age is thought to bring more wisdom. Generally, a person accumulates wisdom over the years. Job 12, verse 12 says, wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. But let's not let's not make the mistake of, of assuming that all older people are wise. We have to take that with a grain of salt. We have to we have to bounce it against what we know and what we see, because you now I mean this to sound harsh, but there are old groups. We can't just automatically assume somebody's old that they that they have the wisdom. So how is wisdom? How do we get this? How are we? to ensure that we are working on wisdom. Well, wisdom only comes to people who have a proper reverence for God. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, the, of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. God is the source of all true wisdom. He's right at the root of it. So to gain wisdom, we must approach him for guidance. How many of you are thinking of James chapter 1. James chapter 1 says we have to ask God for wisdom. And we have to have the confidence that he'll give it. And he will hear us. He will he will grant us what we desire when we ask him. Now, how does he do that? It doesn't say. James doesn't give us the answer. It doesn't say put the Bible under your pillow and it'll osmosize into your brain. He doesn't say that there's going to be a, an opening of your noggin at night and he's going to dump in a scoop of wisdom. He doesn't say that. But if you read a little bit further back in James, James chapter 2, I'm sorry, James first, James verse 2, chapter 1, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I'm reading through three and four. But steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Before he tells us to ask for wisdom, he tells us there's going to be trials. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to draw that line. Hey, I'm going to get wisdom by dealing with trials and pursuing God's answers. So. When we face and overcome trials, our character grows. There's hope there. There's there's great uh, hope for us as we pursue God in the search of wisdom. Some people claim to seek the wisdom, but when it doesn't fit into their preconceived notions, they stop at it, and they never find that there's Some people are very selective in what they want to hear in relation to the pursuit of wisdom. Even back then, Paul wrote in his second letter to Timothy, it's 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. It says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own positions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. 
pursue wisdom through the word of God. Real wisdom benefits all people. Wickedness, earthly wisdom, benefits self. Only through God's commandments can we obtain wisdom. Psalm 119 verse 98 says, Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. We have to put God's word in our heart. Adam was saying that this morning. We have to have the word of the spirit in us so that we can share the word outward and know what wisdom is. It's, it's God's law that teaches men godly wisdom. And that's in, sec, in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 through 8. This, this law is referred to as God's wisdom. There's no obfuscation about what it is. So we've talked about God's wisdom. And we've talked about man's wisdom or worldly wisdom. But there's one more topic I want to talk about this morning. And it's, it's a hybrid. It's a hybrid of, of those two things, of God's wisdom and man's wisdom. And this hybrid exists when Christians infuse man's wisdom as God's wisdom and justify their actions or inactions by the mistaken belief that they are doing God's will when they are really doing their own. Does that make sense? We merge the two together because we do what we want to do, but we convince ourselves we're doing God's will. This hybrid wisdom, it's a little bit of a misnomer to call it wisdom, but this hybrid wisdom is behind those statistics you hear that say 70% of all Americans are Christians. Gallup poll says that about 30% Go to the church regularly. There's a disconnect. This hybrid wisdom shows itself in the attendance declines in American churches, not just the Church of Christ, but across all American churches, across the board. And it's reflected in fewer and fewer young men, young people, pursuing uh, serving God as a career, as a as a as a job. That they go into. You sometimes hear this wisdom, this hybrid wisdom, in statements like, I don't think God would mind at all if we, and then you fill in the blank. It's justifying what we want to do. It shows itself when, out, when people out prioritize their Christian walk because more immediate stuff is in their near term. And they have to do the immediate stuff in their secular lives instead of pursuing God in their life at all. Hybrid wisdom leads to the thinking that others will do the serving and the caring, teaching, and the visiting, and the ministering, and all the other one another things that happen, that need to happen, that we're called to have happen, and anything else that you can put on that list. Don't get me wrong, I see myself in what I'm about to say. We get tired, we get frustrated, we're busy, we get our feelings hurt, we don't want to deal with people that are different from us, or let alone just difficult people. So we justify not doing what God tells us, and instead do what we want. We tell ourselves that we don't know what to do, and if we did, we convince ourselves that we don't know how to do it. We had in class this morning, one of the things that, that the teacher said, the guy in the video, Mike Mazzalongo, said is the power of the message of God is not in the messenger. The power is in the message itself. So when you when you think about that as a practical application of this, I tend to not share the message because I don't feel like I'm ready or I don't want to get in a confrontation. I forget that it's not all about me. God's message is powerful. So if I know that, if we know that, we should be sharing the message at every opportunity. Not just waiting to be asked, but what's your inline? 
if you were a salesperson and you only sold when somebody asked you about your product, you should be a truck driver or something else. I'm not dogging on truck drivers. There's some really smart guys here that have been truck drivers in the past. I've looked at cheap cars. But do you know what I mean? So how do we not wait to be asked about the gospel? How do we interest people in the gospel by what we say and do? So then we get a chance to talk about it. Going back to hybrid wisdom, we are able to convince ourselves that we shouldn't do something because it's not one of our gifts. Yet we don't do the things that we would tell somebody are our gifts. How many of you know what your spiritual gift is? You really know. Maybe you're just afraid of raising your hands, right? How many of you only do at work the things that you're really good at? The boss never asks you to do anything else. I'm in my own box here again. We get asked to do stuff. Well, let's just use scripture. We get asked to do stuff in scripture that is not our gift. But nowhere in scripture does it say you only have to do what your gift, what your gift is. But I'll tell you, if I had a nickel for every time I've heard that statement, it's not my gift, I'd have like 75 cents. That's a lot of nickels, actually. You should, you should add that up. But we can't allow ourselves to be taken out of the game because we don't want to play because it might be in time. That's hybrid wisdom. That's worldly wisdom. It's dangerous because it's widespread. And when you think about it, we can hide in a crowd of others doing the same thing, myself included. And we justify it because then it's the no one. And we're, we're surrounded by people doing the same thing. But God doesn't call us to be part of that crowd. In fact, what's it say about the narrow gate? Not a lot of people are trying to get in. It's not being part of that crowd. But, praise God, there's a solution. This is awesome. God's wisdom is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 65 days a year. The guy in the, the class this morning, there's, there's a lot of wisdom in that class to be sharing the word. He made the comment that 50 years ago, you did not have 24-7 access to God's word. Now, you could spend the rest of your life, literally the rest of your life, surfing different websites that share God's word, that share encouragement. If you just went to the daily verse of the day from all the different websites, you'd fill your day. It is out there. It is, it is surrounding us. We have access. So that's the good news. And you can find, you can you can get God's wisdom via prayer. You can go online, read the Bible on, on in, in so many different versions and language. It's dizzying. You can spend time sharing it with others and being encouraged. You can pull out that print Bible that who knows how many more years will be relegated even more because we've got the Bible with us all the time online there is hope but we have to make that decision because wisdom true wisdom is a worthy pursuit it's worth going after it's priceless but you even if you had all the money in the world you couldn't buy it i mentioned job chapter 28 earlier because you see it tells us that, that wisdom cannot be purchased with gold or silver or onyx Anybody got a big pile of onyx? Didn't think so. How about coral? Mentions that. That big pile of coral you've been saving because you know someday it's going to be worth something? It can't buy wisdom. But in the last verse of that section, Job 28, verse 20, it says, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. To fear the Lord is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding to flee from evil, to run away. We need to ensure that we're pursuing God's wisdom, not worldly wisdom. Not a hybrid, not anything else that, that takes that label of wisdom. We need to pers be pursuing God's wisdom. And here's the why. 
Jackson read earlier chapter chapter one of Corinthians. I'm sorry, first Corinthians chapter two, verses one through five. And I'm going to read it again. But I'm going to add a couple more verses. I'm going to add verses six through nine. Because I want you to hear the why we pursue this. And it starts in chapter or chapter two, verse one. This is Paul writing. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's what Jackson read earlier. We keep going in verse 6. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Here's the why. This is verse 9. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, God has prepared for those who love it. With God's wisdom, we are promised a reward that only God can create, that only he can promise, and that we can't even in our wildest dreams envision. That's what eternity looks like with God's wisdom. Following the world's wisdom may lead to a life of comfort. It may lead to riches. But God's wisdom leads to an eternity in his presence. Guaranteed. We follow his word. So what's the wise choice? What? What is the better choice when you do a when you do an analysis if you're logical like that? But if you're struggling with worldly wisdom, if there's something that needs to change, if you have hybridized the world's wisdom and put it under God's label and need some prayers or encouragement, don't leave here today without seeking out somebody. There's brothers and sisters here that can help you. They can pray for you that will hold you accountable in that shift back to godly wisdom. And the wisest decision that we can make here on earth is to be baptized. If that's something that you need to do to put on Christ, to make that commitment to him, to die to self, to be buried with Christ and be raised a new creature, then we can help with that. Please, if there's something you need help with, Come forward or see somebody. We're going to stand and sing here.